Well, good morning once again. Uh, if you were here for our New Year's Eve watch night service, just shout an amen very quickly. Um, and I know many of you weren't, you couldn't, you had prior arrangements or just didn't work out, you weren't even in the city at the time. Uh, but we had a, a good time of giving praise to God for 2022. And 2022, although better than 2021, uh, was a difficult year, wasn't it? And um, even in the midst of difficulty, great challenge, um, high stress levels, I put it to you that one is still able to give God glory. One is still able not just to find a silver lining, but find nuggets of gold within the cloud that sometimes, maybe consistently, brings you misery. And so the theme for that evening, as it is for uh, most services, but in a special way on a watch night service, is to give God for what has been. Give God glory for what has been. And then also, there is the second side, or the uh, corollary of that service, which is to look ahead, which is to have some type of vision, some type of expectation, some type of goal. Some of you call it resolutions. And it turns out to be nothing more than a revolution of the familiar. You start out well, but you end up back into the same habit, the same place, the same space. But there is a vision aspect to that particular service where we look forward and we say, thank you, God, for what is to be, no matter what it is. But there is an expectation as to these are the things that we are expecting to achieve, to experience, maybe even to overcome if it is a bad habit or a sinful disposition. And so we went through all of that. And one of the things that um, I like to do at that particular service, if it's possible, um, is to reveal a running theme for the year that is to come. And that theme is just two words. It can be three, but the greater the brevity, I think the easier to remember. The shorter, the better. And it's simply this, don't quit. Now, it's not exhaustive in its application. In other words, there are things that you're going to have to quit. If you're smoking, it's a good idea to quit. If you are drinking too much, it's a good idea to quit. If you are doing things that go against the heart and the moral code of God, quit. So I'm not talking about those things right now. I'm talking about pressing on, persevering, travailing, and pushing in to the things that are good, that are great, that God desires for you, and you should not quit in wanting to achieve those things. So let's just say it's a, 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 a bad habit, like eating too many Gatsby's. I don't know who this applies to. Unhealthy. Yes. Feedback. John Gatsby's and he says it's feedback. <laughs> That's fine. I don't know. I can't see anyone anyway. Thank you so much. If I knock my head against the mic, please forgive me. Um, this is new. Um, don't quit. Don't give up. Persevere. Exercise some courage in the time frame just ahead of where you are and put one step before the next or after the next and move forward. It is the clarion call for this year to whatever progress you made in 2022, to establish it even further by pressing in deeper. I want you to, to take a moment very quickly, um, and this isn't meant to be motivational, inspirational type of preaching. Now, don't get me wrong, every sermon, of course, has got to motivate you closer to the things of God, Every sermon that we preach has got to inspire you to obey God and desire you to then uh, uh, spend more time in His presence. But I'm not talking about that type of 
sanctified inspiration and motivation. I'm talking about the type of stuff where the sermon essentially becomes about you and your goals. And it becomes about you and your agenda. And we help you to feel better about your agenda and your goals and your path and your journey. And Jesus becomes nothing but an addendum placed somewhere at the back of your life so that he can validate everything that is you. I'm not talking about that type of preaching. This is the wrong church if you're looking for that type of preaching. You see, we, we have a, we're a little bit more Christ-centered than that. And so when I say that we want to inspire you and motivate you, it's not just about giving up the smoking habit or stop, stop drinking as much as you do if it is a problem or, uh, uh, or eating incorrectly and so forth. Those are all valid goals for a healthy lifestyle, isn't it? However, I think it is not a great goal when it is compared to getting to know Christ better. And so when I say don't quit, don't stop, continue to persevere, it's to the end of knowing Christ. In as far as any activity, any habit, any oppression, even any possession, stops you from knowing Christ, get rid of it. And don't quit in getting rid of it. Quick illustration. Um, when I was much younger, and my father was still around, my father had green fingers. Um, he would work in the garden, especially after his retirement. And uh, in, well, in fact, I was born when he was retired. Um, and his main activity was working in the garden. And while he was able and fit enough to do it, our garden in the area that we lived was like snazzy. Uh, everybody loved it. People came to take photos and so forth. And um, uh, it was a flourishing time, to say the least, um, for the fauna and flora at 140 Grassley Street at the time. But as he went on in age and the arthritis set in and his hands got all crooked, uh, he, he couldn't do that anymore. And I used to help him in those days, and I wasn't a great God, and still am not. Um, but one of the things he always taught me, he says, it's, it's easy to start de weeding because that's what I would do. Uh, my job, because I couldn't really do anything else, was you just say, Listen, you see those things with the yellow flowers? Uh, just you, you pull them out. And he gave me a fork. We didn't have proper tools. And he says, you loosen the ground around it and put your, your fingers all around. Make sure you get the, uh, the, uh, that knot of the root and pull hard. And that's what I did. But after 10 minutes or so, I think, nah, this isn't nice. I don't like this work. I would stop. And then he'd find me watching cartoons on TV, he'd come and call me, and he'd say, listen, didn't I give you a job to do? And he said, it is easier to start the weeding than it is to complete the weeding. And you can replace the weeding there with any other noble task of pressing in, pushing in, and finishing the task. We can apply it to all the learners we prayed for today for schooling. It's easy to start, easy to register, easy to buy the books and the stationery. It is difficult for many, if not most, to press in and apply the same, if not greater, day-by-day -day amount of energy to overcome the challenges of your pursuit, of your goal. It's easier to start than it is to complete. I want you to read with me a very famous passage, one of my favorites in the Bible. It's from Philippians chapter 3. And the sermon title for today is also just two words. Remember, the theme is don't quit. So I want to put it in the positive today, and I'll be preaching on this over the next few weeks and looking at it from almost every biblical angle uh, that we can muster up. Today's message is entitled, Press On. It happens to be also the um, philosophy of the Liverpool Football Club. I'm going to be reading not from verse 12, which is what most of you know. I'm going to be reading from verse 10, which is the start of the goal. Um, if, if I were titling the various portions of Scripture, because you know the little titles that you have on top there are not in the original, uh, well, on the source documents that we have for uh, translation uh, and the writing of the English Bible and other languages. Uh, that's a man-made thing. But uh, I would have started at verse 10. And so verse 10 starts... As such, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Let me stop right there before we even go uh, to uh, verse 12 of chapter 3. So my first major point, which is also a first major challenge to you, is this. Have a worthy goal for your life. Have a worthy goal for 2023. Uh, the God that we serve is an omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnibenevolent, all-loving and caring and compassionate, uh, and an omnipresent all over God. He is magnanimous. He is huge. He is beyond your ability to even contemplate size. Consider the universe and his hand stretches it. He is bigger than the time-space continuum in all its manifestations. He is the creator God of everything, even imagination. That's why you can't imagine greater than God. And so this God, who is in your life, who is actively working, massaging, maneuvering, and wooing you, is saying, have a goal that is worthy of my abilities in your life. In other words, press in with faith. Have a faith in God that complements God. Um, last night, I stayed up a little bit late, later than I should have to watch the... Um, I wanted to stay up to watch the live broadcast of the Australian Open Tennis Grand Slam. Well, they call it Masters these days. And um, I, uh, I, I couldn't manage to stay that late, and so I just watched the highlights of the night before. And I watched Djokovic play against Dimitrov. And uh, I got the feeling. So the first set went to a tiebreak. It was tight. <coughs> and then after that, Djokovic, who I think is like 33, 34 already, he's quite old in tennis terms, just like wiped away his opponent with ease. The next two sets he just won without, I even think, breaking a sweat. And I think he played left-handed as well. <laughs> but uh, watching those second two sets, I just got this impression, this idea, like your very presence on court, Dimitrov, is an insult to my skill and ability. Can someone else who can make me break a sweat please come here? It was like the opponent of Djokovic, former world number one, uh, and, 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 and I think he's the greatest of all times in terms of um, uh, Grand Slams now, when he won it last year. Uh, it was like he was saying, can, can someone rise up to the occasion to honor my skill level in competition? And it's a very similar thought now, we're not in competition with God, of course, but many times the faith, the goal of getting to know Christ is so small, it's so puny, it's almost an insult to God. Now, I'm not saying make something up. There's a process we'll take you through in the next week or two to help you identify what a God-defined goal looks like and what it looks like personally to you. Simple three-step process. However, for this morning, I just want you to understand that you must have a God-sized goal. Now, very quickly, let's do step one at this point. Think about your greatest oppression spiritually in your life. It might be a moral failure. It might be a spiritual imposition. In other words, something that you can't do. Whenever you want to pray, I just can't. It, it might be the desire to uh, do things in the family in a certain way. Whatever you try, it just never seems to come together. Whatever it is, whether it's a sin, whether it's a strategy, or whether it's a system that seems to be removed from God, think of it right now. That would be a worthy goal to say, I'm going to overcome it, I'm going to challenge it, and in the name of Christ, I'm going to press in. Listen to what Paul says here. Listen to this lofty goal that he sets for himself. Now, he's talking personally here, but I think it is um, a worthy goal to adopt. He says, I want, which is desire, to know, which is intellectualism. There is emotional, 
volitional desire mixed with an academic intellect. And he says, I want to know on both of those levels, Christ and the power of his resurrection. You see, the person and the work of Christ, and I also want to know the power of Christ. And let me explain the difference very quickly, if I could use my father once again. Uh, my father was a very strict man, very strict. He, used to, he, he was so strict, he could give you hiding with his eyes, and you would feel it. That's how strict he was. And um, because my father was a bit older in years, I, I'm the youngest amongst my siblings by far. If my oldest were alive now, I think he'd be close to 90. Uh, but he's passed on many years ago. And so we... Um, we grew up in this household, you knew who was boss, you knew what was right, you knew what was wrong, and if you didn't, it's whatever daddy said. And I always knew, and because I was the youngest, I felt I was the favorite, probably wasn't, but that's how I felt, because I got away with some stuff that the others, the older ones, didn't get away with. But I remember I was about seven years old, I knew the person of Anthony Dwani Cornelius, my dad. And I knew him as the guy that um, he had a book, uh, 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 an account, they call it a book, at the local corner store. And I knew that he allowed me to go there and buy a bar one occasionally um, without any money on his name. And he let it slide. Wasn't supposed to, but he let it slide. And I, I knew I got away with a whole lot of other things, doing the garden and pulling the weeds and I'd do it halfway or maybe not even halfway, 10% of it, and he would let it slide, maybe just a stern talking to. But on one occasion, I can't remember what it was that I did. I was about seven years old. Not only at that point did I know the person of Mr. Cornelius, I got to find out the raw power of his hand. There was a different dimension to this now older man who is a shadow of what he used to be in years gone by, but I felt that resurrection power. <laughs> Some of you know, on an intellectual level, even on a desire, volitional, emotional level, I want to know him. That's volitional. It's desire, emotions. And I also want to know the facts about him. Uh, you see these romantic comedies, and there's usually... Uh, not in all of them, but in the older ones, uh, there's a scene, um, I'm thinking of something like Pretty in Pink, where um, right at the end where the best friend who really is truly in love with the girl, but she's after someone else, and there's the scene eventually where Ducky will say, um, uh, do you know the color of her eyes when she's smiling? Uh, do, do you know how many wrinkles on her face when she laughs? And all this type of stuff. And the mere academic knowledge and intimacy of that type of knowledge is a sign that he knows her, therefore he loves her. Academic knowledge, but it's a sign of love. But then there's also the power of resurrection, uh, love, and power. And many people don't necessarily experience that. I know the facts about him. I've been to the Pulse Course. Please come. Um, I, I've been to Bible study. I know a lot about Jesus. I know a lot about the Word. I can pause the Greek and I can quote the Hebrew. But I've never really experienced His power. It's avoided me in that sense. I've got some stuff I'm struggling with in terms of sinful oppression. And I haven't experienced this great power of deliverance where He smacks whatever it is that attacks me. That brings me anxiety. That causes my spiritual stress levels to rise beyond what I can handle. And he says, you need to know me in that dimension as well. So I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. What a lofty goal. Notice he doesn't say I want to know Christ and uh, the, the uh, power of his resurrection and I want to know him in the power of his prosperity. No. He says, I want to know him in the power of his sufferings. I'm going to end here because I can, this is a series I'll pick it up next week again. But let me, uh, the first, I have a lofty goal. Second point, just based on verse 10 and 11, is this. Many times you and I are defined by what we are fighting. 
by what we struggle with. Um, what causes you to suffer? What causes you passion, which means suffering? So if you are an alcoholic, then that's how people define you. That's your identity. There goes Peter, the alcoholic. Uh, if you are uh, uh, an adulterer, well, there goes Peter, the adulterer. You are defined by your greatest public struggle. And when it becomes public, of course, when people don't know about it, you won't be defined by it. But when it spills over into the public, that's what you become defined as. Here's Paul saying, I want to be known as someone who struggles with God. I want to be in the fellowship of his suffering. I want to take the yoke of Christ, it's still a yoke. It's still something that is going to be placed upon you. It's going to demand pain management. But my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. And Paul says, my goal, yes, is to know Christ volitionally, emotionally, academically. But I also want to know him sufferingly, passionately. And I want to attach myself to him. Let me ask you this question simply. Are you willing to be identified by your suffering for Christ or your suffering for sin? I'd rather, the answer is Christ, by the way, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> let's, let's be very clear there. But you must be identified by your struggle with Jehovah God. You remember Jacob before he became Israel? And Jacob's ladder and the angel of the Lord, which is most of us believe is God himself in a manifestation of, and he wrestles with this angel, he wrestles with the Lord, and they, they're wrestling for a good few hours, it was a real WWE match made in heaven, and the angel touches his hip, and basically deforms his hip, breaks it, um, and he's walking with this divine limp for the rest of his life, and then his name is no longer Jacob, but it is Israel, which means he was contended with God. He now becomes identified by his very struggle with Jehovah. And because that's how the world operates, that's how this earthly domain uh, 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 works, God says, you struggle with me. You find fellowship with me in your suffering, and I will defend you. So in your victory, because I'm the God of victory as well, I'm the God of more than enough. And so when you've got more than enough, and when you are walking in obvious public victory, guess what? People identify you with Jesus. And when you are suffering and you are brought to humility because you don't know anymore, and the last thing that you can do is cry out and say, Jesus, help me. I've got nowhere else to go, nothing else to do. I've been to all the doctors. I've been to all the academics, all the clever people. All I can do now is touch the hem of your garment. Help me, Lord. Guess what? They're going to identify you with Jesus as well. Have a goal that's worthy of the God that you serve. Number two, that goal must be defined not only by the great ecstasies found in Scripture, it must also be identified with what you contend with, what you fight with, what you suffer with. And then it says, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow, in fact, Paul doesn't know this. He doesn't know the process. He can't explain it to us. Nowhere in Scripture will you find the five points as to how this process works. But all he knows is God is the author and the source of it. Just by the way, uh, when it comes to identity theory, you are identified on this plane in this world by your sufferings and your failures. Uh, and so fail in Christ because even that is an honor. But in Christ, you are identified by your maker, by your source. So as long as you're connected to the source, even when you struggle and even when you fall, hopefully forward, and you fail, you are still associated to Christ. He is your identity. But he says somehow he doesn't know everything. You don't need to know everything. You just need to have a lofty goal. But I don't know how it's going to happen. That's okay. It's God's domain. Somehow. Uh, how's God going to accomplish this? Uh, I'm riddled in debt, and one of my goals, not mine, I'm okay, uh, 
but one of my goals is, is, is to get out of debt and, and, and move away from living from hand to mouth. And I know it's a lot to go because everybody in my social circle is in the same position. It's a great goal. Somehow. You don't have to know it all. You just have to know he who is in charge of it all. Verse 12, and we'll literally end with verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. Sorry, folks, that was an ocean basket yesterday. The prawns are a little bit. <laughs> Number three, first one, have a lofty goal. Number two, be defined by Christ either on the ecstatic side of it, on the victory side of it, or even on the uh, 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 the depressed side of it in the suffering, passionate side of it. And then verse 12, he says, in keeping with the theme of a somehow, I don't know. He says, I haven't achieved or obtained this goal. Not yet. But I press on. And the press on is um, what you do in the interim. God achieves it, yes. But he achieves it with a responsible servant responding to his grace. And here he defines is you press on, you persevere, and you respond with an uh, action that glorifies God. Take it day by day. Take it little by little. Um, let me give you an example and challenge you for this week, and then I want to say some things on the week of prayer. Because prayer is the very definition of pressing on. And so he says this. Listen, um, getting to know Christ is a worthy goal. But take it in bite-sized pieces. And if you don't read your Bible every day, I, I read my Bible on my phone most of the time, or my PC, these days. So I, I, I don't care where you read it and on what medium you're reading it. But read it every day. Soak yourself in it every single day. And take it in bite sizes. Maybe read 10 verses today. Tomorrow you could read an entire chapter. But you press on in the discipline and the routine of a godly, glorifying, beneficial to you practice. Haven't achieved it yet. But in the interim, I press on. Allow me to pray for you before I make one more announcement and appeal concerning prayer. If those of you who are sitting here today, maybe it's just been presented to you that a goal uh, that is as lofty as what Paul has said is beyond you. Maybe this morning you are enlightened enough to say that's a goal worthy to follow. It brings honor to the big God that I serve like to pray for you. Maybe you are someone who, who only looks at the ecstatic and not the necessarily the passionate side of things. Um, and you want to give God praise for that. And you don't understand that maybe I need to embrace suffering in general as part of God's process of refining me. And maybe certain aspects of suffering. Um, I, I deal quite easily with suffering for Christ. Where it's like very obvious this is because of Jesus. So if, if I'm preaching and someone says, I hate your preaching, I don't even believe there's a God, that's easy water for ducks back. But general suffering, well, that's a different story. I don't always place that under the banner of Christ. And sometimes you wonder how to deal with it. Well, it's all the same. It's part of God's refining process. I'd like to pray for you too. If you're only looking at the bright side, ecstatic side of things, maybe you need to embrace some suffering in Christ Jesus a little bit more so that he can refine you a little bit more, press into it, lean into it a little bit more. And last but not least, of course, is press on. That's the discipline. That's the strength of consistency day by day that builds up a character that is strong, godly, and honoring to Jesus. If any of those things hit a point today, you can stand right where you are, and I'd like to include you in this prayer. Feel free to do so right now. Let's not waste time. If the Spirit is working, the Spirit is working. If you're going to 
respond and respond if you're not going to that. Fine. The truth has gone out. Thank you for your responses. Again, might I add that your response, as glorious and as great as it is in the kingdom and in the advancement of the kingdom in your own life, is not something that we as preachers, from all the preachers in the church at Mountus Pulpit, are in the flesh interested. Uh, there's no competition between me and Gideon or Ronnie or any of the other preachers where well, I've got 60 people to stand today or well, I've got five to stand today. Nothing like that. This is between you and God. And we count it an honor to be of service when people respond to the challenge of his truth. Let me pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you that you are faithful to your own word. And I thank you that it is only within the Christian ethic and understanding that passion and suffering can be glorious and ecstatic, all at the same time, all under the same purpose, all bringing glory to the same magnanimous God. You are great. You are worthy. You are wonderful. I pray, dear Lord, Father, for those who are standing for any of these three major points, whether it is the discipline of pressing on, whether it is, dear Lord, an exchange of ecstasy uh, for passion, or whether, dear Lord, Father, it is simply having a goal that is God-worthy. Whatever it is, in Jesus' name, give it to them. May the grace of God fall upon them. And I ask, dear Lord Jesus, that you be glorified and they receive the benefit in the mighty name of Jesus. As all God's people say, amen and amen. Please be seated. Thank you. If anyone needs a chat after the service, there's usually like 10 to 20 people who want me to see me after the service. Uh, but if you do need a chat, please just hang around and tell me you want to chat and we'll, I'll get to you um, uh, eventually. Uh, so please do, do do that if you require it uh, as a result of the sermon today. Um, I want to say a few words before we close. Worship, I think you can come up so long. Um, on the, pray, the week of prayer, which is not this week coming, it's next week, uh, Monday. Monday to Thursday, um, the week of prayer uh, will be in your homes. Um, and... Uh, Hopefully, we, we're going to get a response, uh, a, a great response, not just from the congregation here gathered, but from others who are not here as well, um, in that um, when you uh, we, we want to send a prayer team to your house from Monday to Thursday, it can be during the day or in the evening, we'll do both. We'll have some people available during the day and some people available during the evening um, to pray with you in your home. Uh, well, it could even happen at work if it's during the day. It's up to you. Um, and um, and it's, it's not pray for you. It's pray with you. It's a week of prayer, right? Uh, but also, of course, to pray for you in your home as, as, as part of the program. Um, and so for this to happen, um, we've already, uh, the, the elders are automatically on that list. So we've got five of us uh, already. Um, but we, 